All right. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to try to talk about the book of Isaiah tonight. And Isaiah's by far the greatest prophet. He is the man. He's the Old Testament man. And you might say that Isaiah is the Jesus prophet. So everything we know about Jesus, we know about the forerunner that was to come for Jesus through Isaiah. The birth of Jesus has a couple of uh, special passages. The death of Jesus is talked about. The ministry of Jesus is talked about. So 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah was talking about it. Okay. He is the prophet at the end of the northern kingdom's existence. The Lord told them to cut it out, and they wouldn't cut it out. He begged them to seek him. They wouldn't seek him. And unfortunately, at that time, one of the three worst countries, evil reigns on earth that have ever existed, the Assyrians, happened to be taken over the world, and guess what happened? The northern kingdom was the tool God used. Well, Isaiah is actually a literary genius. He uses 2,186 words. Um, let's see, Ezekiel used 1,500. Jeremiah used 1,600. The Psalms used, you know, 2,000. So Isaiah, he's articulate. Hosea and Micah were his contemporaries. And he died at the hands of Manasseh, the Satan-worshipping king, when he was sawed in half. So, it's a hard way to go. And, and really the book, what I'm going to do is just roll through it and let's see what happens, okay? Uh, here's the problem. We got all these radical pieces of Bible in Isaiah, but for me, lots of the fun are just these little words, little phrases, little statements where God speaks powerfully in, in the personal journey. And so as you're going through the history lesson, guess what else? You get to have this personal conversation with God where he comes up the page and, and ministers to you. And, and so God has a complaint against Isaiah, the, the Israelites. Um, he says, sons I reared up and brought up have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, a donkey its master's manager, but Israel does not know me. My people don't understand. And, and then he says, you know, bring your worthless offerings no more. Okay? Uh, your incense is an abomination. I, I can't endure your sins and your solemn assemblies. I hate your festivals, your appointed feasts. They're a burden to me. I'm weary of them. Cause me to wonder if the Lord ever has an opinion about the way we show up. I don't mind saying you showed up, you're in good standing, okay? But have you ever shown up with the wrong attitude? You know, come and start judging somebody like that person way over there, you know? Or, I don't know, just going through the motions. Cain gives God the offering. He's just doing the same old thing. Abel says, I'm going to bring God the best. These guys are just going through the motions. They don't have that personal spark going on. And that's what God desires in our lives. He's looking for relationship. He says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. In fact, one of the major themes in Isaiah over and over and over again is taking care of the orphans and the widows and, and the, the hurting and the hungry. He cares about them the broken people. And, and here's what the problem was. In the northern kingdom, they were a wealthy crew. And so they did a lot of trade. They deepened their pockets. They indulged in all kinds of sinful pleasures. And they didn't take care of the poor. And, and God really held it against them. You know, and I, we, we, we have to, as I said last week, Taking care of the poor needs to be on your agenda. 
at least know you're given to a church that's taking care of it. You, you need to be thinking in terms of, I have a responsibility for those less fortunate than me. And then chapter 2, God's talking about the universal reign. This is when they hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and they won't learn war anymore. This is the plan. It's going to be a peaceful place someday, which is nice to know because I think in the history of the world, there's only been 286 years where there wasn't war. That's a lot of war, okay? And so that's going to be done. Well, I love the last verse of chapter 2. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils. Why should he be esteemed? And so often we're worried about what people are going to say, what people are going to think, when we really need to be playing to an audience of one because what he thinks about us has, well, more impact. And not just because our heavenly destiny is, in, is, is on the line, because he's ready to move in our lives now. And, and this is the problem. Israel doesn't turn to God. Okay? They give him lip service, but they don't really follow him. Um, they display their sin like Sodom. They don't even conceal it. Woe to them. Uh, they grind the face of the poor. Um, he says it's putrefaction to me. It, there's this, this verse in chapter 5. He says, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? And it talks about how he, he planted it and dug around it and built it and hewed it and expected grapes and no good ones came. Right? He says, woe to those who rise early in the morning to pursue drink. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine, valiant men in mixing strong drink. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Now there's all kinds of examples of that going on in our society today. Okay, and I'm not even going to stop and start pointing them out. But let me tell you, we got things backwards right now. It's almost, in fact, there's a, what's the harbinger? Is that 910, Isaiah 910? It talks about that where America right now is in the same exact place that Israel was when they ended up losing everything. Chapter 6, it's the radical call of Isaiah, the one that Kim read to us. Um, Isaiah's in the temple. He sees the Lord. He sees the seraphim. The holy, holy, holy's going on. The foundations start trembling, and he says, woe is me. I am ruined. I'm a, I'm a sinful man, and I live around sinful people, and I'm looking at God. And God steps forward and says, First of all, he touches him and says, your sins are forgiven. And then asks the question, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he says, here am I, send me. What a response. It's not an easy response. Because while there's nothing greater than the Holy Spirit moving through you, sometimes you're going to go up against family members. Sometimes you're not going to be liked at the office. Sometimes your friends don't want to hang out with you anymore. Sometimes you're called to, to give away money and make changes in your lifestyle and, and, and stop doing things you like doing and start doing things you don't want to do. But you're following the path of God. Um, like Isaiah in uh, chapter 20, he has to... <clears throat> walk around nude for three years, okay? Now, that's one thing if you're at the beach, all right? It's a whole other thing when you're being made a, a, an example of the kind of severity that's going to be coming your way, all right? And, and there's this weird verse in chapter 6, by the way. It says, keep on listening, but don't perceive. Keep on looking, but don't understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they're going to return and be healed. You go, well, doesn't God want to heal them? 
Yes. But here's the problem. A lot of people, they accept the religious offer because it's eternal fire insurance. Let me get this straight. Jesus died for my sins. All I have to do is say, I accept you as Lord and Savior, and it's a done deal. I like it. Where do I sign? No, that's not what it's about. That's just part of the deal. You now get to have a relationship with God. You now get to experience Him all the time. Um, it's not just about getting saved. And, and there's, something, there's something powerful in Ephesians 4.19. It says, they became callous. And if we're not careful, we become callous. That we're not listening to God anymore. We're not looking for God anymore. We don't even start really believe in God anymore. And, and the fruit of mishandling God is, you know what? You, you, you lose him. That's why he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. And the problem that I already told you is, Assyria is going to be coming. Oh, by the way, chapter 9, I love it. This is when the child will be born to us, the son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Here's one of the Christmas passages that Isaiah talks about. Another really fun one is, is Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Where have you heard this before? Matthew, right? And then you go to seminary and they say, well, actually, the word for virgin just means young maiden. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know. If Matthew's using it as a verse to endorse Jesus, and I'm thinking this, he's probably a lot closer to the original language and understands the use of the words, not to mention the Holy Spirit was involved in writing it. I, I, I'm not quick to uh, release that from spiritual power. Well, we keep rolling. Uh, again, 10. So as to deprive the needy of justice, rob my people of their rights, so that the widow may be, will be their spoil and, and the plunder will be the, the orphan's plight. See, what we don't realize is when corporate America is rolling, they crush the little people. And they don't see it. They're not aware of it. When it gets brought to their attention, they don't care. Okay. The folks at the top are so far removed from what's going on. You know, and I'm just bringing this up as a stupid example. The people in the sweatshops making the Nike tennis shoes. You know, the ones that go for 300 bucks. And those guys get 7 cents an hour or a day, something crazy. Okay. This is the kind of stuff that bothers God. And you and I can go out. It's a shame we can't do anything about it. We could stop buying the shoes. Or you know what you could do? You start a petition and everybody in celebration signs it. Then we get everybody in Orlando to sign it. And then it starts cruising around and it gets to uh, the lobbyist. And well, that's a bad place for it to go, huh? So we shouldn't do anything, right? Because it'll get stuck there. Wrong. You got to keep pushing. And if God's pushing behind you, you can get some justice happening. And that's what we're supposed to be about, justice issues. Well, the Assyrians are coming. Um, again, in, in history, they're among the three worst people of all time. I would love to tell you the details, but only a few of us guys would really like to hear that stuff. It's pretty gross and nasty what they would do to human beings. Okay? And, and so, uh, kind of interesting that if the Assyrians get Israel and Judah, there will be no Jews, Christians, or Muslims. All that's gone. And if they can stop the Jews, then there's not going to be a Jesus coming our way. Once again, you see Satan always throwing things to stop the plan of God. And he's using formidable foes. 
Chapter 11. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf, and the lion. The boy will lead them. Somebody's reaching into the cobra's hole. This is how life's going to be. This is what Jesus has planned. And the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. What does that mean? It means you're going to know his goodness. It means you're going to understand his grace. It means you're going to experience his love. You're going to see his power moving to and fro in your life. That's his plan for all of us. Well, he's got all kinds of judgments on the Babylonians. He's talking to all kinds of folks. And then, out of nowhere, in chapter 14, it's a Satan piece. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, star of the morning, son of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth. You who weaken the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I'll sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. And he gets cast down, cast out. He must have been a radical being in order to think that he could take over heaven. Must have been a radical being that one-third of the angels threw in their lot with him. Must have been radical. So I want you to understand that that's the guy you're up against when sin is knocking at your door and temptation is rolling before you. That's the guy who's causing all kinds of havoc, wars and disease and poverty and pain and brokenness. Of every kind. That's the guy responsible. This is why we need to take sin a little more seriously. You know, we dabble in it so casually, not realizing the evil behind it. I remember one time in Oregon, middle school, they were having this problem. Girls had just started putting on lipstick. And so they would go up to the mirror and they'd kiss the mirror. Lipstick all over the place, you know. The janitor's like, what do I do? How do I get this stuff off? So uh, one day the principal calls in all the, the girls and says, girls, this is a real problem. It's hard for the janitor to get this off. And the janitor, will you show him just so hard? And so he takes his mop, dips it into the toilet, and washes <laughs> off. Okay? You know, if we knew the filth behind what we're so willing to kiss... You know? Well, I digress. So we, we keep cruising in uh, Isaiah, and, and we come to this place where it's kind of funny. In those days, God says, weep and wail, shave your heads and wear sackcloth. And instead, there's gaiety, gladness, they're partying, they're drinking. Let us eat, drink, for we die tomorrow. And they just don't get it. They don't understand what it means to, to get serious about their faith. And so, here's what's coming on. Chapter 25. He's talking about what's going to be happening for, for, for humanity. Verse 4. For you have been a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. I had that one underlined when I moved to Florida. <laughs> he will swallow up death for all time. The Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces. He will remove the uh, reproach from his people from, from all the earth. This is the ministry of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 25, chapter 8. I mean, 25, 8. It, it's, it's all laid out here. What Jesus is going to do. I don't know, I get excited about this stuff. And then I want to bring into my favorite. Um, all right, here, one more time. Let me, before I get there, 2913. Because this people draws near to me with words and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And, and the service they send me is merely routine. You know, I was reading last night, William Law, he has 
He wrote this book in the 1600s. It was like the book, carried Christianity for a decade or so. The serious call to a devout and holy life. And then he talks about how we have this great prayer life, but it doesn't transfer over into the way we live our lives. So we got this religious side, and then we got the way we live our lives. And we cover the way we live our lives in our prayer times going, oh, Lord, please forgive me. And then we go back and we live without a thought to, to what God wants for our lives. We don't forgive our enemies. We don't care for the poor. We don't deny ourselves. We don't fight off sin. We don't invest in other people. We don't seek healing. That kind of stuff. We just say, what's in it for me? And, and we go back to prayer. Oh, Lord, feeling bad. Please forgive me. There's got to be a connection here. And I think all of us, we have our cafeteria-style Christianity. Okay, take a little bit of this. Oh, no, I don't want that, thank you. You know, Yeah, please give me more potatoes. I need the grace of potatoes, but I don't want the vegetables of you know, self-denial. And, and you know what? We don't grow correctly. Man. We don't get the kind of nutrients that expand our souls and deepen our our spirits and cause us to have radical ministries. Is for a bunch of broken Christians. And in fact, William Law in the, that book says that's why the world rejects Christianity because we're not doing it right. And and this is him talking in the 16th century. People are walking away from Christians today because they don't see the prayer life and the real life lining up. So you and I have to think about that when we're at work, when we're in our leisure lives, you know, even when we're making our goals. I talked about that on Sunday. Our goals can be an idol. We have our plans and we say, hey, God, would you bless these plans? No. What we do is we say, hey, God, what's your plan for my life so I can arrange it around what you want? And when you live that way, all these things that you want will be added unto you. Okay? his call on our lives well chapter 30 my favorite verse in the bible you will hear a word behind you this is the way walk in it whenever you turn to the right or to the left this is how intimate God wants to be in your personal life when you get in that spiritual zone and you are saying, God, which way? All of a sudden, he starts guiding you. It's the coolest thing ever. Okay? And sometimes you don't even have to be in the spiritual zone. And if you're used to listening to him, you're going to be shocked how often he's going to guide you through his Holy Spirit. You know, in the same chapter, he says, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He waits on high to have compassion on you. Do you see the heart of God? I mean, he really, really loves you. Really, really, really. I mean, he's in love with you. Well, God's appealing to them, and they won't change their way. God's threatening them, and they won't change their ways. So now, the Assyrians are going to come. It's a real bad day. All right? They, they took 46 fortified cities, not even thinking about the towns and all the people that, that were uh, seized. Um, they went to Judah and took 200,000 people and carried them off. Um, they're destroying the northern tribes of Israel. And, and they won 800 talents of silver and 300 talents of gold and a talent of 65 pounds. So they're extracting a heavy tax on you if you'd like to still be a country and live. Okay? And they took the king Hezekiah's daughters, his wives. They seized the male and female singers. I don't know about the drummers. Okay? <laughs> and, and so here's what happens. They start saying, hey, Hezekiah. What's this confidence that you have that you are deciding not to allow us to take over Jerusalem? 
And he goes on and on in chapter 36. He says, Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of, the Isra- of Assyria? And here's where he starts to make his mistake. He starts, It would have been fine if it was human to human. But now he's starting to taunt God. Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their land from my hand that the Lord would deliver Jerusalem from my hand? It's now a God versus Assyria issue. It's become a theological situation. And you got to like Hezekiah. He covers himself with sackcloth. He goes into the house of the Lord. You have an overwhelming problem? Go to prayer. Carve out the time. Carve out the space. Usually when I'm overwhelmed with the thought, I'm too nervous. Okay? So I got to take my pencil and write it down. And I can't just stay on my knees. I got to get up and fidget and pace. And, and I try to go back to my knees. But I stay in the same place. I'm talking about when you got a problem, all right? And this is what Hezekiah does. He went into the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord all the words that the Assyrians were throwing at him. And he says, help. He said it more eloquently. And, and this is what God says, because you prayed to me, I'm going to take care of the situation. And he says to the king of Assyria, I know you're sitting down. I know you're going out. I know you're coming in. I know you're raging against me. Because of your raging against me and your arrogance and it's come to my ears, I'm going to put a hook in your nose and a bridle in your lips. Everybody's accountable to God. Okay? Especially the king of Assyria. So what happens? 185,000 Assyrian soldiers didn't wake up the next morning. All right? Um... Guess what? God moves in our frightening situations. What's the formula? Spread it out before the Lord and ask him for help. That's the formula. Isn't that too easy? That's the formula. But don't I have to do this and stop doing that and, well... It's probably a good time to get things in order. But I don't even know if that's necessary. As much as spreading it out before the Lord and saying, God, I need your help. He might say, well, I want you to address these things like you did to the woman caught in adultery. Go and sin no more. Okay? Let's get this figured out here. And it's kind of fun because Hezekiah, he becomes mortally ill. And the prophet says, set your house in order. Because you're going to die and not live. And so Hezekiah doesn't go, oh, I got a cancer sentence. This is horrible. He says, Lord, come on. Please. And so the Lord says, I heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. I'm going to add 15 years to your life. I don't know. I think this is beautiful. Okay. Do you see the mercy of God? Do you see how, whether it's 185,000 soldiers or a personal problem that you might have, a serious one like dying? And then he doesn't just go, thank you. He goes, well, how am I going to know this? And he goes, I'm going to cause the shadow of the stairway to go back 10 steps. And this is important because you know what this means? It means that God is in charge of nature. He can alter the circumstances in your life. He's a real God and he really cares about you. And I think he likes to show off. Okay. Well, there's all kinds of verses and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to pass through uh, many of these until I get to my favorite chapter of the Bible. 43. Thus says the Lord your creator and he who formed you. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you. 
The rivers are not going to drown you. You can walk through fire. You're not going to get scorched. Because you're precious in my sight. And I love you. Do not fear. I'm with you. You know, it's kind of interesting. And at the end of this chapter, this is what God says. You have brought me not sweet cane with money. You haven't filled me with fat of your sacrifices. In fact, you've burdened me with all your sins and you've wearied me with your iniquities. And I, I am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake and I will remember your sins no more. Did you see the logic of that? It wasn't logical. You do all this and I'm going to forget about it. That's the kind of God you and I belong to. He's not focused on our sins. He's inviting us to understand precious we are to him. Well, I just want to get to a couple of places, and I'll let you go. Chapter 45, there's no one besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I'm the Lord who does all these. You go, well, well, wait a minute. What do you mean causing calamity? You mean allowing calamity? It's not what it says. I think we forget just how serious this God is. Just how passionate he is about your life. About the world situation. How sin gets in and destroys things. He wants us to get it out of our lives so that we're not influenced by it. And he wants to help get it out of other people's lives. And he might cause situations to go against us. For our spiritual benefit. I think that's what happened with Job. Remember? So, it's just this crazy stuff. Belonging to God. Wow. Amazing. How about this verse? You have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will be with you. From birth, graying years, it's happening sooner than later for me. You belong to God. Isn't that? It's powerful stuff. You're supposed to get excited about these things. Okay? Here's another one. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. This is Isaiah 49, 16. Do you, I, I, just, I want you to feel the commitment and the love that God has for you. This is the Jesus of the Old Testament book, and this is what you and I are supposed to experience. Well, just a couple more things. Um... Chapter 53 is about Jesus. Our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. Smitten by God and afflicted, he was pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell on him, and by his scourging we are healed. Jesus stepped in, And took your punishment so that you only get God's love and grace. It's pretty humbling, isn't it? He stepped in to cover you. And then all throughout this chapter, it talks about he was poured out to death, numbered with transgressions. He bore the sins of many. He interceded for the transgressors. Chapter 55, why do you spend your money on that which does not satisfy? Doesn't that sound like us? We buy this and we pursue that and we get all consumed with something else and it doesn't really satisfy us. It's not like that place where you go and experience God and there's really nothing like that. Okay. 
And, and it's the great, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and thoughts than your thoughts. And, and how about this powerful verse? So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. I'm sorry, I'm not... I'm just reading the Bible to you. It's probably better than anything I could ever say anyways. Okay? I guess I just want you to see how many cool things are in the Bible. Chapter 58, the lifestyle that God wants is to loosen the bonds of wickedness, undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to give your bread to the hungry and the homeless, to cover the naked, a whole bunch of things here. This is what he wants from us. Okay? Well, two more things and I'll let you go. I know I said that four times already. <laughs> 59, 16. The Lord, it was displeasing in his sight. There was no justice. And he saw that there was no one and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. He's hoping that you and I will step forward and say, here am I, send me. I'll do something about this. Or, or I'll let you do something about it and use my life. Are you open? Are you willing? Last thing I'll say. Chapter 61, the Spirit of God is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, to send Send me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners. Do you remember who said that? When he started his ministry. What was he doing? Quoting Isaiah. Well, I have to stop because I said that'll be the last one. <laughs> Man, my Bible is underlined, and there's so many cool things in Isaiah. And if you weren't already reading the Psalms, I'd be forcing this upon you. But what's really cool about Isaiah is there's just these little tiny quotes that seem to speak right to your situation, right to your problem, answering your questions, empowering you with promises. When you get done with the Psalms, you should go right there. Yeah, there's a couple of boring chapters. But for the most part, everywhere on the open book, something's underlined, something's circled. Because God had something to say when I was journeying through it. He wants to talk to you. If you're not in the Word, get in the Word. Okay? Because He wants to talk to you. He wants to bless you. He wants to guide you. Can I, can I have you real quick? You know, in the door article, this is, what, this is what it says. I wish I could find it immediately. It says, well, basically it says, you should read that, by the way. <laughs> no Christian is going to be worth anything if they're not scriptural. If you don't know what the Word of God says, you're going to get beaten up by the world. You're not going to be working with His promises. You're not going to know the power that's available to you. You're not going to get covered. The enemy's voice is going to always be wearing you down. Okay? The Bible is a gift from God to you.